This is One on One. The public television family is uh, pleased to welcome Willie Cole, who is a visual artist and a perceptual engineer. You got to help me on the, this uh, perceptual engineer, Willie. What is that? Well, I engineer new ways of seeing, basically. It's a term I got from the advertising world, perceptual engineering. Mm -hmm. They orchestrate and create new ways for us to see society. You were a graphic artist. Yes. When did you make the transition to being full-time artist? I made artist? the transition after getting fired from a computer graphics job <laughs> in 1981. <laughs> when, for art, excuse me, when it comes to art, when did you know, other than, I don't think it was when you got fired, or I don't know that. No, not at all. When did you know that art had to be a part of your life? Art has been a part of my life since I was born, really. Um, at three years old, my mom found me tracing the Sunday comics. And from that moment on, Where my was family it? always called me an artist. Where was that? Uh, that was in, in the city of Newark. The city of Newark. You know, what's so fascinating in reading about your background is that you, didn't, you never really had any, unless I get this wrong, you'll tell me, you didn't have anyone pushing you or saying, you're the one, we'll back you, here's financial backing, here's right. marketing, here's whatever, here's... Who was pushing you? Was it you? I was pushing myself, but I had a lot of uh, emotional support for being creative. But no one in my environment understood the profession of being an artist. So that's something I just grew into on my own. The profession of being an artist, so what I'm fascinated by is the whole question of how one is an artist and pays his or her bills. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't meant to be funny. Right, it, it is funny. Okay. But, it, when you, were first, when you first became a professional artist, you were on certain corners in New York City. Right. And you were putting out what kind of art? I started out uh, as a professional artist selling art on the street, making color Xeroxes of my paintings, standing on the corner of 6th Avenue West Fourth, and West 4th Street, yeah. selling those color Xeroxes framed and doing portraits. And that was after I got fired from the computer graphics job. <laughs> I know it's a cliche question when someone says, was there a, a big break? Was there a significant break for you? Well, the most significant break to me was just my awareness that it was, that it was real, that it was possible. I know I'd, I had worked as a graphic designer in the old tradition with the ruling pen and the X-Acto knife and the press type and then computer graphics. And I did that as a freelancer as well. So once I lost my full-time job, I realized the struggle to be a fine artist was the same as the struggle to be a freelance graphic designer. I was always looking for people to give me opportunities, knocking on doors, getting rejections. So I said, if I'm going to get you know, beat up, I'm always going to get beat up by somebody who, who I really want to communicate with as opposed to just trying to make a dollar. And so you're doing what you're doing. You're trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. The business side of art, were you handling that yourself? Oh, always, always. Uh, the first step, though, was getting the knowledge. I read a lot of books about the art business. About had, the business? About the business of art. Uh, a book called The Art Dealers. It told me about all the top dealers in the world, what they like, how they got started in business, how they select artists, who they show at this time. So that was very motivating for me. Plus, I had a friend who was an art dealer. He sold African art, and he was always very encouraging. Um, so, so... Mom, why don't we do this? There's a piece, because we've been talking to uh, artists who are connected to the Newark Museum, and we're going to be showing this piece that in 2012, excuse me, 2013, I think, yes. that the Newark Museum purchased called Soul Sitter. Yes. Describe it, and then you told me before we got on the air how it happened. What mm -hmm. is it? Uh, Soul Sitter is a six-foot-tall bronze replica of a piece that was originally made out of I think maybe 12 high heel shoes. 12 so high heel shoes. So first made small out of shoes and then blown up through technology to a larger piece and cast in bronze. Um, it is an example of perceptual engineering. Um, it reminds you of the Rodin piece called The Thinker. Yeah. So I was very aware of that, but I didn't want to call it The Thinker. I called it The Soul Sitter because I like the double entendre of shoe soles, the human soul, and all that thing. And uh, he's sitting and, and thinking. <laughs> you know, 
uh, the other piece, could you show the other piece, Georgette, and talk us through it? This piece. What is that, Willie? Oh, yes. That piece is called Eye Candy. Eye Candy. Eye Candy, Go E-Y-E ahead. Candy. Eye Candy is, uh, well, I have done a lot of work out of high heel shoes. And most of the concepts grew from a list that describes the way that we perceive females in society, whether it be positive or negative. You got to give me more than that. <laughs> <laughs> you, gotta give, you can't. What? So the title comes with that awareness, eye candy. But they're basically just masks or heads or busts made from high heel shoes. You see things there that no one else that sees. That's why I'm the engineer, yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, put, put up something else, then I want you to react to it, and we'll right. talk us through it. Go ahead. Uh, so this is the soul sitter in its original state. That piece is not made of, uh, well, that is a bronze, actually. That's the original size. That piece is the same size as the original shoe sculpture. Right. So it has a different name. Once I enlarged it, it had more presence. So I had to get a new name. But it existed in my studio for years as almost a toy. It was like the torso, the legs, and the head, all separated. So I could pose it this way some days, <laughs> this way some days. But then at some point, I decided to make it a permanent piece. And that's the result of it there. OK, let me ask you this. Because your work is so original, I, I know people could use that word, overuse that word. Was there anyone who really inspired you? moved you in a certain way? In history? In art? Um, everything inspires me. But there were markers Influence. Of, Sorry for interrupting. Is there a difference between inspire and influence? Influence. Yes, there's definitely a difference. Inspire means in spirit. Anyone influence? Uh, influence, just awareness of art history. Uh, I studied African art in high school, because I went to high school during the time of sudden black consciousness awareness in the 60s. Uh, in college, I had uh, Rosalind Jeffries, who was a great professor of African art. So that was great inspiration. But in Western uh, art history, I was inspired by Marcel Duchamp and Pablo Picasso, mostly. And well, I don't know if we'll talk about my paintings and drawings, but by the Impressionists, their sense of color, even the theory of, uh, of light, inspired by physics, how they talk about particle theory, about Everything is made from one thing, mm. and now I pretty much make things out of single objects. So it all comes, all that just comes together. These are the times that I wish I understood more. And I, I appreciate <laughs> just listening to you, mm. and, um, and I know you helped the public television audience understand or appreciate just a little bit more about your work, but more importantly, they should go online and check you out. Thank you, Willie. Oh, thank you. That was great. All thank right, you. All right. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and by the Newark Museum in cooperation with NJTV and 13 for WNET. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at Newark Museum has been provided by Bank of America, PSE&G, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, The Fidelco Group, Johnson & Johnson, Prudential Financials Global Communications Department, and by Barnabas Health. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.